Hello, and welcome to St. Andrew. It is my privilege to welcome you here today from the St. Andrew Sanctuary. I am grateful as always to share this sacred online space with you, where we are all invited, included, and valued as vital and beloved members of our broader worshiping community. St. Andrew is proud to be an open, affirming, inclusive congregation that welcomes all people into the full life and communion of our church. This includes saints and sinners, believers and skeptics, the lost and the found, the wanderers and the wanderers, families of all shapes and sizes, and people from every point along life's journey. No matter who you are or where you've been, no matter what you believe or even if you believe anything at all, you are welcome here and you belong here. If you have any questions about our church, prayer requests for our care team, or if you would like to get in touch with a member of our pastoral team or staff, please email info at gostandrew.com. If you would like to explore deeper engagement with the St. Andrew community through our many classes, group life gatherings, and service opportunities, you can email us directly at connect at gostandrew.com. We'd love to hear from you. Lastly, to contribute a financial gift to the work and ministry of St. Andrew, you can always visit gostandrew.com slash give or text St. Andrew to 28950. And now, let's listen together to this week's scripture and sermon. Thus says the Lord, Who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters? Who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior? They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things, or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people the people whom I formed for myself, so that they may declare my praise. Why Christian? That's the question we've been asking over these last six weeks. And maybe it's a question you've never asked before or thought you could ask because you've always been told or always assumed that Good Christians don't ask such troublesome questions. Maybe it's a question you can't imagine ever asking because at this point in your life, maybe you've arrived at a place on your faith journey in which you've discovered the answers and resolved the paradoxes and connected all the dots and found contentment and peace with God. But maybe you're not really so sure about why you are a Christian or why anyone would ever want to be one because you've been hurt by people who call themselves Christians or you've been disillusioned by God or the church or because Christianity seems so judgmental or out of touch or hypocritical or primitive or unbelievable. Maybe you're like the brave one who handed me a note after church last Sunday that read, you saved the possibility of my faith today. Or maybe you're like the three brave women in Denver who made the news this week after being denied communion by their priests for wearing rainbow-colored masks. Maybe you're not alone after all. Maybe you're one of a growing number of people who genuinely long for a kind of Christianity they can believe in, but are growing weary in their searching. And so we ask, why Christianity? Why Jesus, why the cross, why the church, why the Bible, and today, why hope? It's perhaps the most relevant and urgent question of this entire series because hope seems to be in such short supply these days. For the first time in history, more than half of all American young adults ages 18 to 29 feel, quote, down, depressed, or hopeless. 
More than one quarter of all Americans today report levels of depression that would typically trigger a referral for further evaluation. Last year, in 2022, annual deaths from alcohol, drugs, and suicide in the U.S. reached an all-time high. More and more people today are struggling mightily to get through the wilderness of life. Why hope? Christianity has a lot to say about hope. The word hope is mentioned over 200 times in the Bible. But Christianity also has a a lot of theological baggage to unpack when it comes to explaining why anyone can and should have hope. Historically, much of that baggage has been front-loaded with promises of salvation and heaven and eternal life in the next world rather than offering people anything meaningful or tangible to hope for in the life we're actually living in this present world. For many Christians, hope is primarily grounded in a future with God in heaven, and faith in Jesus has been turned into something like an eternal life insurance policy that guarantees we'll get there someday. But when so many people today are struggling just to get through the wilderness of this life, the promise of getting into heaven in the next world feels so out of touch and even escapist. When I was in college, a a guy from down the hall knocked on my dorm room door. He showed me a a hand-drawn picture of a great chasm between two steep cliffs. And there was a cross in the middle, bridging both sides. On one side of the chasm, he said, was me in this world. And on the other side of the chasm was God in heaven. And what keeps me from God in heaven is my sin here on earth. And my sin leads to eternal death. But the cross of Jesus leads to eternal life. And would I like to accept Jesus right now so I can walk across that bridge? And I said, wow, I, I know last night's party got pretty crazy, but is there something I'm not remembering here? What his hand-drawn picture suggested was that baked into the universe was this natural and timeless separation of the human from the divine, the holy from the unholy, the earthly realm from the heavenly realm, this present life from eternal life. It implied that God is just too holy for this messy world and we are just too messy for God's heavenly world. So we must be rescued from this mess to get to God and we must abandon this life to experience salvation in the next. I didn't cross the bridge that day. I still haven't. Because my dorm room visitor that day was wrong. His view of the universe that separates God from humanity and spirit from matter and divine holiness from human messiness and heaven from earth and hope from reality. It's just not the gospel. It's not even biblical. And neither is his brand of Christianity that says God wants us to be rescued from this messy life and this messy world so we can find salvation and eternal life in the next. The Bible paints an entirely different picture of the universe, which is why we can hope. Today's scripture is about an oracle sent by the prophet Isaiah to the Jews living in exile in Babylon. Judah has been defeated by the Assyrians. Jerusalem has been destroyed. The temple leveled, families separated, innocents slaughtered, and the survivors carted off to Babylon as captives. The Jews have, at this point now, been in exile for about 70 years. Nearly two generations have come and gone. Hope of ever returning home has faded. Their frayed faith hangs by mere threats. How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land, they ask. They hang up their harps on the willows, weeping. 
assuming they will die in Babylon just as their parents have. And, of course, they're sick with regret because it didn't ever have to come to this. They had refused uh, to listen to the prophet Isaiah, who had warned them years ago that if they didn't stop fleecing the poor and taking bribes and neglecting their sick and their widows and their orphans, they would get what was coming to them. And then it was too late. And what they had coming to them finally came to them in the form of the Assyrian army. And what that army brought was death and defeat, mourning, exile, homelessness, homesickness, hopelessness. Decades later, this oracle comes to them in exile. A message from Isaiah, the prophet, who is still living back home in Jerusalem. It's a word of God. And the word of God says, Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. Isaiah gives the commentary. The past is the past, he says. God isn't looking back, neither should you. And here we have a message of forgiveness. But there's even more. In the oracle, God says, I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? Isaiah says, look, God has this fresh vision for your future. God is offering you new possibilities for you to walk into that future. God wants you to go home. It's good news. Unimaginable, unexpected news. And then God tells them how they can get home. God says, I will make a way in the wilderness. It's a message about homecoming. They'll be freed from captivity, liberated from Babylon. They'll be given a chance to finally go home to Jerusalem. But there's just one highly problematic detail in this plan. They must walk through the wilderness on their own two feet. There is no other way. God will not rescue them supernaturally. God won't be scooping them up and transporting them home by some miraculous display of power. This won't be some magical twinkling of an eye arrangement where they'll wake up tomorrow morning in Jerusalem in their own beds hearing the sound of trumpets. Nope. I will make a way in the wilderness, says the Lord. But you will do the walking. This presents a serious problem. I checked Google Maps this week. I typed in Babylon as my starting point and Jerusalem as my destination. It turns out to be about 520 miles straight through the desert. Google says it'll take me about 231 hours to walk it. Waze, of course, it says 228 hours. And, oh, watch out for car on shoulder. That's a long way to walk through the dangerous wilderness. Isaiah says there are wild animals out there, hungry jackals, some hard-hitting ostriches, but even these will cooperate with God's plan. Isaiah says there's, there's just no water out there, just, just pools of burning sand, but even the dry riverbeds will flow with streams for you. Creation will cooperate with this divine plan, says Isaiah. But what about the exiles? Will they cooperate? Will they go? That's the question. The Jews have this troubled history with wilderness journeys. Generations before, they fled Egypt only to get lost in the desert for a hot minute. They panicked, complained, nearly starved to death. They cursed Moses. They worshiped idols. They even considered turning around and going back to Egypt. So the wilderness is remembered as a, as a symbol of estrangement and despair and loneliness. It's the place of temptation and emptiness, barrenness and desolation. So for the exiles, it, if there's anything more hopeless than the prospect of wasting away in Babylon, it's the very thought of walking through the wilderness. Maybe we're no different, really. We often think of the wilderness as spiritual metaphor 
for those life experiences in which we feel lost, alone, afraid, helpless, vulnerable. Like the exiles, we'd, we'd much prefer to be rescued from those moments. It's natural. We want to avoid the wilderness at all costs. We want a, a way around the wilderness, not through it, because we can't imagine that there would be any hope to be found there. But the wilderness, it turns out, is precisely where hope is found. This idea of hope in the wilderness is everywhere in the Bible. In the Bible, the wilderness is where bushes burn to spark new revelations, where manna rains down to feed the hungry. It's where burning pools of sand become pools for the thirsty, where divine messengers attend to the weary, where dry bones rattle and hum and come to life, where the still, small voice is whispered and heard. It's where angels wrestle with you all night long until you discover who you really are and who you might still become and what you are to do next. The wilderness is really where you finally run out of answers and run out of crutches and run out of excuses and you stop looking for rescue or a way out or a way around because you discover that the only way is through and that you make the way by walking, not by sight or by certainty, but by faith and by trust. Why hope? Because all of life is wilderness, really. And God is in the wilderness making the way with us. I think so many people today struggle with modern Christianity because modern Christianity is hopeless. I know that sounds odd. Let me explain. Too many modern Christians have traded hope for optimism. Perhaps you've always assumed hope and optimism were the same, but there is a major distinction between the two. Optimism is actually a mathematical concept. It's a way of seeing things through the lens of probability. Optimism is, is a gambler's calculation, really. It, it looks for certain outcomes that are more likely than others, simply based on the odds. A close friend of mine plays in professional blackjack tournaments. He's scary good. He seems to know the odds of every hand he's playing, and he always plays each hand purely according to those odds. If he draws a bad hand with questionable results or odds, he doesn't hope for the best. He just folds. He takes his losses because to him, it's all just math. A lot of Christians are optimists. There was once a, a French uh, philosopher. His name was Blaise Pascal. He was a, a Christian optimist. Pascal argued that belief is like a wager. Either God exists or God doesn't. And Pascal said the odds are essentially 50-50. And so faced with even odds, Pascal said we can make our wager based solely on the potential payout or loss associated with believing in God. He said, if we bet that God exists and we're right, we stand to gain eternity. If we bet that God exists and we're wrong, we really lose nothing. If we bet that God does not exist and God actually does, we might lose eternity. If we bet that God does not exist and it turns out God does not exist, then we gain nothing. Assuming that mere belief in God is the all determinative factor in gaining eternal life, the gambler's calculation, motivated purely by the payout of eternity, compels us to wager that God exists. We have nothing to lose by believing in God and being wrong, but we have everything to gain by believing in God and being right. Much of modern Christianity has been turned into a game of Christian blackjack, a gambler's calculation. Believe these doctrines, say these words, pray this prayer, confess those sins, follow these rules, join this team, 
and you will go to heaven. That isn't Christian hope. That's Christian optimism. It's the gambler's calculation. It's playing the odds. It's betting on the payout. The hope, that's different. Hope isn't the gambler's calculation. Hope is the wilderness walk from Babylon to Jerusalem. Hope doesn't put its faith in probability or the odds or certainty. It's not motivated by payout or reward. Hope looks at the wilderness and knows the odds are unfavorable. It knows that doubt is warranted. But it still takes the over on God. It still dares to put money down on God's loving presence. In this way, maybe hope is a little like rhythm and blues or, if you will, country western, both of which wrestle honestly, poignantly, with that tension between love and despair, between hope and heartbreak, between knowing and not knowing, and the possibility that things may not go as you have planned but that you will still go on, that you will make it. Have you ever in your life had to walk that spiritual wilderness between Babylon and Jerusalem? Have you ever had to walk, trust, act, hope against the odds? There's an ancient story about the decisive moment when the Hebrew people walked through the wilderness the very first time. In the Exodus story, just after they had fled Egypt, they reached the shores of the Sea of Reeds. You've probably seen the movie. Do you remember that unforgettable scene when Moses raises his hand over the waters and the sea suddenly splits apart, allowing the Hebrew fugitives to walk through it on dry land as Pharaoh's pursuing army draws near? Some of the ancient rabbis later taught that maybe it wasn't quite so clean and simple after all. One rabbinical teaching imagined that when the Hebrews reached the shores of the sea, the waters actually did not miraculously part as Moses commanded. The rabbis imagined a different scene where all the leaders of all the Hebrew tribes are debating and arguing about what to do next. It's mass confusion. Nobody can agree on what their next move should be. And they're staring at this impassable sea right in front of them, while Pharaoh's army is fast approaching right behind them. And they're trapped and they're terrified and death is imminent. But at the height of desperation, a certain chieftain from the tribe of Judah steps forward His name was Nakshan. And according to the legend, Nakshan is the first to step into the sea and start walking. And following Nakshan's lead, all the Hebrews stop arguing with each other and they enter the sea and are saved. But the best part of the story is this. According to the ancient rabbis, The sea didn't automatically part when Nakshan stepped into it. He had to keep walking. And it wasn't until the waters reached his nose that the sea finally split. Hope. Hope is the brave one who walks through this wilderness knowing something that the rest of the world doesn't know and doesn't suspect. That's the message of Isaiah. God will make a way in the wilderness and you will do the walking. And in the walking, you will find hope and hope will guide you home. Why hope? Because all of life is a wilderness. This world, this life, your life, your faith, it's all wilderness. And the wilderness, the wildness, the weirdness, the messiness of our life is where God meets us and makes a way with us 
whenever we dare to walk. Today's takeaways, all of life is wilderness. God is in the wilderness making the way with us. God's way is not rescue from our wilderness, but redemption of our wilderness. Hope is knowing something in the wilderness that the rest of the world doesn't see or suspect.